bio didn't have to review. Um, <laughs> because if I didn't know it, I would probably get in trouble. Um, so, but I'll give it to you anyway. Um, uh, Marcy is a research scholar here at Princeton. Um, she works in the area of human-computer interaction. Uh, prior to coming here, uh, she was on the faculty at the um, College of Information Studies at the University of Maryland. And prior to that, she was teaching a PhD at Georgia Tech and was doing a computer science and data systems program. Um, she works a lot at the intersection of um, technology, both networking and otherwise, and how users um, interact with and uh, sometimes struggle with uh, the interfaces of these technologies that then get into their work. And today, she's going to talk to us about um, things such as Wine Through the Sky and the um, things that some things that we like and some things that we may not be totally comfortable with. Um, and with that. Great, thanks. Um, <coughs> okay, so he won't be getting in trouble. <laughs> but um, yeah, thanks for having me to talk about drones today. So I thought, um, like any good talk should, we should probably start off with um, some Lady Gaga. <laughs> um, so let's see if we can get it going here. So those are drones that are making the light show. Okay, that's probably enough Lady Gaga for one talk. Um, if I can stop it. Okay. <laughs> so. Okay, so that was at the Super Bowl a few weeks ago. Okay, so Lady Gaga had a whole bunch of drones that were powered by Intel making this really nice light show um, where there was you know, thousands of people watching. And I thought I'd show you that just to show you that you know, drones are becoming more and more ubiquitous and being used for a variety of reasons. And the reason that we're talking about drones So the reason that we're talking about them is because it, this is the of drones is uh, going to increase to tens of billions of dollars in the next decade. Like from the Lady Gaga video, you saw that it's an unmanned aerial vehicle and or aerial system. And what we're mostly going to be speaking about in this talk is what's called a small UAS, or small unmanned aerial vehicle. These are drones that are very small in size. They're up to 55 pounds or 25 kilograms. And they have a varying flight time, some from just a few minutes to about half an hour, or just under half an hour. And they're remote controlled. They can have basically autonomous or pre-programmed flight. They're also varying in size, so here is a little toy drone, this is called a crazy fly. It can fit probably in the palm of my hand. And some of the larger drones can be about this big or even larger if they have to carry a package. And they're used for various different things. Um, we saw Lady Gaga, drones being used for light. Fly them around for entertainment or hobby 
of services, right? Drones can be um, flown to remote locations and take remote footage, so people like using them for different purposes. Um, so here's an example of one of those drones. This is one of the drones that we use to take pictures of the Mars surface. actually to carry people. Why do we care about drones and privacy and security? Well, it turns out that there's a lot of different reasons why we care about drones and privacy and security. And they can carry a payload, right? And many things can go wrong. So uh, around Christmas time, there was this hashtag on Twitter called Drone Crashmas, just to kind of uh, document the phenomenon of all these people getting drones for Christmas, and then shortly after the drones take off, they usually land up, you know, on someone's roof, or, you know, if they've crashed, or they've also got, you know, there are lots of pictures here of drones getting caught in people's hair and things like that, right? So drones can malfunction, right? It actually takes some skill to man a drone, as I discovered when I tried to fly one in the classroom in the CS building the other day. Um, it wasn't successful, but nobody was injured. Uh, just, it was just a bit of team pressure. So they can malfunction. They have a short flight time. So not only can they malfunction, but you know, drone battery life is limited. So a drone could fall out of the air because it's not in the right battery, or it could lose connectivity with the, um, the person who's using it. go into spaces where they may not be wanted and record data about people, but they can also actually injure people. So clearly you're thinking, well, surely there's some regulation to prevent all of this. It turns out the Federal Aviation Agency has some regulations to prevent all of this. it's not necessarily true that you would know if they're following the DOJ rules, right? Um, this is my drone certification. It says I am a drone controller. Um, does anyone know what I had to do to get that certification? And how much time I had to spend? To fly one? To fly my big <laughs> carrot <laughs> drone? Yeah. I had to pay $5. <laughs> and yes, all I had to do was go online fill out a little bit of information about my drone, say I had a Parrot AR drone, and answer a few questions, and then I got my certification. And I was told that, you know, I just have to put this label on my drone and I'm good to go, right? Um, and yes, shortly afterwards, I was busy crashing my drone in my office. So if, you know, even if you're actually taking the time to register your drone, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are any better at flying the drone than anyone else. So what kind of work has been done in this space? If we're thinking about drones and privacy and security issues and, and thinking about people who might encounter drones, what have people looked at in terms of how people perceive drones and these issues? So it turns out there are many surveys of user perceptions of drones in general, and these, ha these are many in other countries like Germany, Australia, um, the UK and Italy, but there have been far fewer studies of users' drones, privacy and security in the US. One of the recent studies was in 2014. Here they surveyed the users of perceptions of drones. And what they got out of the study was kind of, you know, just like a lukewarm perception of drones. At this time, people were not that familiar with the concept of drones. They weren't as much in the news. And, um, you know, some of the technologies were not as developed for delivery and things like that. So mostly people were pretty positive about drones but didn't really have much to say. A more closely related study happened in 2017. Um, recruit people and then show them their drone, which was a DJI drone. 
and basically then ask them a series of questions about specific scenarios of drone usage, right? And they found that um, people had many concerns about the drones being privacy invasive and so on. In this study, they didn't show everyone the drones, they didn't allow users to control the drone, and also we weren't aware of the study while we were doing our study. So, um, you know, our study kind of builds on this work, but also adds some different dimensions um, to this question of what do users perceive uh, are problems with privacy and security around drones. So that's the main question that we were interested in in the study. And we also wanted to tease apart, you know, as compared to these surveys where they didn't really show people drones or give them the opportunity to control the drone, you know, how, did that, how does that differ? Like, what are the issues when you don't really show people a real drone versus when you actually show them a real drone? was to recruit um, three users. This happened at the University of Maryland at College Park last year between March and May. And most of the people who participated in the study So I'll take you through um, the method. So first we screened people. We decided that we would recruit by a you know, mailing list, word of mouth, and so on. And we wanted to make sure that um, we didn't use any words related to privacy and security when we were recruiting people so as not to bias them. We also asked um, users generally about their privacy and security habits, so we included a bunch of um, privacy and security related scales in this pre-screener. And then finally, because we wanted people to come in and interact So we wanted to get fresh perspectives from people who weren't drone owners, who weren't regularly using drones. Next, people came in and they participated for a model drone that we built. And the reason for that is because, again, we wanted to see other privacy and security issues affected by actually seeing a real drone and experiencing it, or are those the same issues that come up even if people are just sort of thinking about this conceptually? We audio taped and videotaped each, se each session, and um, as we always do with HDS studies, we gave people a gift card to say, thank you for coming and speaking to us about drones. So the first thing they did when they came into the study was they did an interview. We asked them about things like their general perceptions of privacy and security, what did these things mean to them, and then we made um, And that was before we showed them the drone. And then finally, we had uh, one of the students showed her drone registration from the FAA. And we had people discuss this and annotate it to see, you know, what kinds of things were they okay with and what do they want to fix. In this talk, I'm only mostly going to speak about the things that came out of this part of the study, um, but I won't be talking about the sketches and the registration if the students don't mind. So here's kind of what our drone looked like, um, the Parrot AR drone that this model is. get their perceptions around certain aspects of privacy and security. So I'll go through each one in turn. So the first thing was we wanted to get people's um, perception of drone, you know, around what the drone means. Monitor, which we 
was streaming the footage from the drone on the monitor. At this point, the researchers wouldn't say anything. We just wanted to see, like, do people notice this? Do they feel uncomfortable? Or are they just going to go about the experiment as normal? The next thing we did was um, we wanted to see, you know, how do they feel about drone privacy, I mean, physical safety and security around the drone. So at this point, we had the drone, um, and we pre-programmed these actions. We had the drone hover slowly towards the participant. And at this point, the researchers started asking the participant about um, some questions on the survey just to see how comfortable they would feel answering questions while the drone was watching them. After that, the researcher controlled the drone and actually um, demonstrated different things that the drone can do, how it can lift up, you know, hover, land, um, do various actions. And then we allowed the participant to control the drone. So again here, um, a drone flight can be a little bit erratic, so we pre-programmed the drone with a series of actions, and we just allowed the participant to press a button to perform these actions, because we didn't want them to crash the drone or injure anyone, like themselves, the researchers, or damage anything on the drone. So this is kind of what our very rudimentary interface looked like. People just came up, um, they could say lift off, this would then illuminate, and then they would just go through each um, button, and here are the actions that the drone can do. And that, we wanted people to basically see all the different types of things a drone can do in terms of movement. So for the people who did not interact with the drone, so that was the other 10 people in the study. We basically built this model drone, which was kind of the same size of the, as the drone. And essentially, we had them do all the same tasks, but instead of the real drone, our facilitator moved the drone to mimic the movement of the real drone. So it would still inch towards the person. Um, obviously, when the person came in, they didn't see footage of themselves on the monitor. And then we used task cards, and um, the researcher explained what the scenario of use would be. The user still controlled the model drone with the app that we had. And at the end, we showed them pre-recorded footage of, um, of the drone. Sorry, I think I skipped that one. But the last task for the drone users and the non-drone users, we showed them footage that the drone had recorded. So the last task was to actually see, like, this is the video that the drone recorded without me. At the exit interview, this is the last part of the session. We basically asked people about how did you feel when you walked in the room? Um, what are your thoughts on privacy and security now, now that you've experienced the drone or the model drone? To analyze the data, we transcribed all the entries. So we audio taped and videotaped everything. And then we did an analysis of the sketches, the interviews, and all the annotations that they had made on the registration card. And we did something called open coding, which is basically looking for a phenomena of interest in the transcripts and then pulling these together, discussing it with the research. Okay, so who actually ended up in the study? So we had 10 people per group. In the drone, and he had never operated a drone. And from our privacy and security scales, we found that most of the people were kind of average. You know, they were had average attitudes about privacy in general. They were below to average in privacy-related behaviors, and they were about average for security behaviors. So what did we find? Okay, first, let's talk about what privacy is. Having it only go to the person that you're trying to send it to. Here's an example quote, and I'm, I'm sharing this with you. So 
here, you know, the person is basically saying something like, well, you know, it's the knowledge that you would like to keep things to yourself. It's basically like your backyard. You know that no one else is going to come into that place unless you actually invite them in there, right? And generally, people said the same thing about security. So again, knowing that you have a boundary around your property, you know that that's keeping you or giving you some measure of security. So what about drone strikes against security? Okay, unsurprisingly, much like some of the, um, at least the study in Syracuse also showed, drones are seen as privacy measures, right? Most people talked about things like drones are, you know, the drone feels like it's spying on you. It feels like it's watching you. Um, they use terms like that. People were also concerned about the drone recording them without them giving consent for the recording. And then finally, even before seeing the drone, What is the feedback that I get to say this drone is recording me and how do I even know if there's a drone in my vicinity? So here are some examples of the type of things people said. Maybe you want to record some stars or spy on people, right? So this came up again and again. Oh, maybe people are going to use them to, you know, spy on famous people. Someone else said, you know, you can put up a wall Other people had privacy concerns because they said, you can't really see their that people can actually see into your window, or you don't know if the camera is actually pointing somewhere else. In terms of security, people were really worried about drones damaging or injuring things. Um, so people talked about of birds or, you know, should drones be flying out in nature? How is this going to affect um, the natural environment? Especially if a drone malfunctions, for example, and it's just left and discarded in the environment. Most of our people said that they were worried about drones being modified. So people talked about things like, you, like you had mentioned, having a gun, you know, what if someone gets a gun and attaches that to their drone? Or what if the drone is carrying a bomb? You know, how do I know that the payload of the drone is actually something safe? And then people spoke about air traffic. So if you have a lot of drones flying around, people were worried about, you know, how would it be enforced that these drones would not actually interfere with planes and other things where we need them to be safe. So here are some examples of things that they said. So here this person said, look, I assume they have blades and, you know, they could kind of just, you know, hurt people and, you know, what if they are getting in random accidents and they're flying too close to people? That wouldn't be great. Um, here's something else that people said, you know, again, I'm worried about air traffic safety. You know, how does this fit into air traffic control systems when drones are flying around along with uh, planes? So related to this concern about drones actually being a threat to security, like injury, damage, and so on. People spoke repeatedly about wanting a distance between drones, people, wildlife, and other things, right? So they spoke about how far away should a drone actually be from a person? How far away should it be from a building, from wildlife, and, and other things? And related to this, people said things about, well, what about
this this could be really creepy and also very dangerous. And most of the people said that they should not have, you know, drones should not be allowed to fly near a people pleaser, right? So the idea of having a drone come over here and not knowing who's flying that drone was very, very disturbing to people. So here are some of the things that people actually said, you know, drones bumping into other drones. That doesn't sound like a good idea. I mean, again, this is more likely to lead to damage or injury. People also mentioned that if drones are very close to buildings, then they could maybe see or detect private information. Someone said, well, what if I could read the credit card number you know, from your phone? How do I know that that's not possible if a drone is flying too close to me? And then with multiple drones, people said things like, what if this is actually going to cause noise pollution? You know, what if there are a million drones going around the Empire State Building and people are trying to get work done? How is that actually going to affect not just privacy and security, but just the general environment? So like some of the previous um, studies had kind of alluded to, the main issue with drones is about the fact that a drone could be flying but you may not be able to see the person who's operating the drone, right? So there's no accountability to link a drone with the person who's operating the drone. Because if you can't see them, you don't know who's recording them. And in the actual experiment, especially the drone participants were saying, well, you know, after they'd seen and controlled the drone, they said, well, since I can have it so far away from me, it, it's almost like I have the sense of detachment. Maybe I'm more likely to do bad things since you know, that drone is so far away and no one can see that it's me doing it in the first, um, first place. The other thing that people spoke about was this link where you can't see who is flying the drone. They said, well, it's not the same as someone walking by and taking a photo of me with their phone because I can see that person. I might even be able to go up to that person and say, hey, delete that photo. Well, with the drone, a drone could be flying around on campus and you may have no way to know Who's owned, who owns the drone, or how to stop them from actually recording information about you. So that was basically the disconnect there. Who's controlling the drone? Um, and then related to the recording, especially with multiple drones. So this person was basically talking about um, and imagining drone deliveries by Amazon and saying, well, you know, maybe I said it's okay for this drone to deliver a package to my house, but what about all the people along the way on the route to my house? Did they get consent to actually have their, um, this drone flying through their space? So those are kind of the negative perceptions of drones. Um, just briefly, people did mention a few positives related to drones. So they mentioned things that we kind of hear in the news, you know, drones take footage of really hard to reach places. But those things were much less pronounced, especially after people interacted with the drone or model drone and actually saw how big the drone was. Okay, so it's about time for another video. Um, so what came out of our study, and this is especially since we compared people who saw drones to people who didn't, was that the actual drone itself really affects how people feel about privacy and security. Um, so I'm just gonna show you a quick video of, where is it, where is it? This is just the drone itself, just so that you can see what this particular drone Okay, that's usually how it ends. But so you can see that the drone is kind of, it's, I mean, you can't hear it so much there, but it's quite loud actually. 
it makes quite a large sound, uh, um, loud sound. And again, you can't see it in this video, but it actually produces a lot of wet. So if the drone was hovering next to me, you'd probably see my sweater actually fluttering because it produces quite a bit of wind. Um, and the other thing is, uh, it's those movements were pretty smooth, but it can also be quite erratic. Um, one person in the study described it as, it almost looked like a boxer, you know, kind of darting to and fro um, because it's not quite stable. So I'm just going to talk about, okay, when people saw the drone flying, what, what kinds of things did they say? Um, and this is the drone people, but also the people who saw the model drone. Um, the people who saw the drone were more likely to say, it seems threatening, it's kind of scary, it's loud, it's noisy, it seems unfriendly. And they compared it to things like, this reminds me of the Terminator, it reminds me of military. You know, it's, the drone itself is very, it's black and sleek. So all of these things made people say that this seemed like something that was kind of threatening to them. And this particularly came out in the people who saw the drone versus the, the people who saw the model. People commented on the color. They said, you know, the fact that it's black and sleek, again, it evokes images of military purposes. Um, for them, they said maybe colorful logos or colors would help them to look more friendly, and it would also help them to identify perhaps who owns the drone. So maybe if you saw like Amazon colors on a drone, you'd know, okay, that's an Amazon Prime drone. Um, both the non-drone and drone people commented on the drone size. So a lot of people were quite surprised when they saw the drone because the drone itself is probably about this big, but with the guard, it's about this large. So it's quite a bit larger than people had imagined. Um, and people mentioned things like, okay, with regards to privacy and security, size can be a problem. Like something that's like this small, you know, this could be a problem because it can get into spaces that it shouldn't be in, right? So that, what if it's spying on me by flying through like pipes in the building or something to get in and film me somehow, right? And then when people thought about bigger drones, they worried again about the payload. Can this drone conceal a weapon? Can it conceal a bomb? And then the sound But at the same time, a lot of people told us that this helped them by identifying that a drone was nearby. So it was one of the ways that they could tell a drone was nearby. Um, so here's where you know, I got the title from my talk. So people like this participant who hadn't even seen the real drone. Here's one of the people who gave us an example of they were at a wedding in Seattle and they heard this annoying sound and they were trying to figure out like, what is this sound, what is this sound? And then they realized it was actually a drone like filming the wedding, right? So again, here people said the sound is actually a good thing in some ways because it's a privacy enhancer. I think it's a bit unstable. Right, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's doing what it should be. I'm not sure if it's, you know, supposed to be flying like that. Um, actually, when the drone rushed towards people in the experiment, uh, especially in the drone condition, like a lot of participants in the videos, we saw that they didn't, you know, they sort of flinched a little bit, but then they just kind of looked at the researchers and saw that they didn't duck and thought it was going to be okay. So again, the drone movements, like it rushing forward and things like that actually how it moves also affects whether people feel secure or not. So now I'm going to show you a video of the actual footage that the drone um, escaped. So this is my student, Ethan Kuchka. So this is a video from the drone. Doing studies is hard work. Did anyone notice anything about the video? Safety. Testing the future. Oh, crash. Oh, it's coming back. Oh, no, I've missed me. Yes, there's no audio. Okay, so um, a lot of people 
noticed that when we came in the city, that there was no audio. And people actually were very glad that it could not, you know, it made, it made them feel better that the drone could be watching you, but not necessarily, not necessarily listening to you. Um, and some people thought the noise of the drone itself would actually make it hard to put something on the drone that could record sound. But now, when we showed um, them the footage, and even when they saw the footage as they walked in the room, you know, people said, look, I, I don't understand where this video was from. Like, a lot of people commented on, you know, usually when they walk in and they see a video camera, they know something is filming them. But in this case, they walked in and just saw, like, footage of them, and they weren't sure where it was coming from, right? So it kind of surprised and disoriented some of our participants. And mostly, people didn't like this idea that, I mean, you, you kind of saw that the drone, it does look like it's looking at you, right? That's the perspective that it takes the footage at. And one person said, well, you know, it's not clear where the camera location is. I don't know what it's pointing at. I don't know how it's recording me. And that's kind of cheeky, right? I don't know if it really is looking in the window when it's hovering outside or how exactly the footage looks like. Um, related to that, people also said that it was very scary that the drone data is so easy to access. So like that video that, um, that I showed you of my, my students, it's quite easy. Like as soon as you fly the drone, it automatically takes a video, like at least with the one I have, and then it's very easy to share that video on YouTube. You know, you just click share and anyone has it basically. Um, so I did a bit of searching to just show you some more creepy drone videos. Um, so here's another creepy drone video. just shows you, okay, so this is the video from a drone. Probably this person does not follow the FAA rules, just does not look too far <laughs> up. But um, so you could see there was another drone there as well. But I mean, you can see, you can, you can have pretty fine detail. Like the cameras on some of these drones are really good, right? Um, so, you know, this is a drone flying around. And then basically, yeah. Yeah, and you can see it, you know, the drone carries on flying and then it flies, uh, flies over some hills or something. But yeah, so the camera is, it's pretty good on the drone. By the way, current law says you may not fly over people, period. Yes, yeah. So you're not supposed to, but people do it anyways because it's very hard to enforce the law. But there's evidence. Yes, <laughs> that is evidence. But you have to link the drone owner to the evidence, yes. So someone should find that person and tell them to go through it. Um, <laughs> but those in the room do not have to. Yes, okay. <laughs> but um, so one of the things about the camera resolution that people kept mentioning was that, you know, um, yeah, even though you're not supposed to fly it over certain things or close to certain things, um, what if you can zoom with the camera, right? What if you're flying near the White House or Mar-a-Lago or somewhere? And you can zoom in and you can <laughs> see what's going on, basically, right? So they were really concerned about the actual resolution of the camera. And they were also worried about, you know, how this was actually being regulated. You know, the data from the drone is really easy um, to get. And people were concerned about where is this data being stored? Who has access to it? Um, what if the data transmission is intercepted, right? Okay, so that kind of wraps up the kinds of things that came out of the study. What does this all mean, right? What are some of the implications of this um, now that we know a bit more about what people are concerned about? Okay, so the first thing was definitely and also people spoke about this limiting distances between people, drones, and buildings and other things. And that would really seem to enhance people's sense of privacy and security. So for example, on campus, I was speaking with the people who are doing the drone policy today, and they were saying one of the rules that they are trying to implement on campus is that drones are not allowed, I think, you know, more than 50 feet between the drone and a, and a building, right? So they can't literally come and hover and see what you're doing in the classroom. And they're also not supposed to be near residences and things like that, right? Um, and the 
this will also help mitigate some of the security concerns as well, because if drones are not allowed near people or buildings and things like that, then that also keeps those spaces more secure. People also spoke about not wanting drones near not just the White House, but things like schools with their kids, private residences, other government buildings where people should not be spying on them. And so we thought one thing that could be better done is the idea of geofencing, which is basically you know, creating an invisible um, boundary around the place. Some of the drones actually have this built in. So DJI, one of the drones, But what if we could use other existing infrastructures like Wi-Fi networks or something like that to help create boundaries so that drones are not allowed near buildings? Um, we spoke again today because I'm doing a seminar on drones um, and the folks who are doing the drone policy came today. And they were saying, you know, what if you could just have something that you could create a temporary barrier around something? Like say you're having an event and you're saying, okay, boom, and no drones are around are allowed near this place for this time period. Um, related to that, what if that same system could also help you track if there are drones in your vicin vicinity, right? The idea behind tracking is that if you can track which drones are in a vicinity, then you can um, have better accountability because then you can actually see um, who might be flying a drone, if they're actually authorized, for example, to fly on campus, and you could link the drone to the drone owner if something goes wrong, right? The second thing that we kind of got out of the study was that people kind of wanted drones to be in a separate space. Like if they thought about multiple drones, like in the Lady Gaga scenario, or if Amazon Prime becomes a reality, they were thinking more along the lines of drone highways, right? Where drones have a designated space, you know that's a drone space, and it's not just that drones are flying any which way to make a delivery over other people's property and things like that to their homes. <coughs> Whether this is actually feasible or not is an open question. And then finally, <coughs> the actual design of the drone can clearly make a big difference in terms of how people perceive the drone, right? If you have a colorful drone um, that looks very friendly, people might be more likely to approach it. Perhaps you don't want that and you want to make your drone look unfriendly. Right? These are some things you can still play around with. Um, color, shape, visual identifiers can also help people, again, link the drone to the drone controller. Here on campus, one of the ways they want to help people identify an authorized drone controller is they're giving drone controllers this bright yellow vest. So if you see someone operating a drone and they don't have their bright yellow vest, um, they should also have a card from campus saying that they are authorized. Um, then you know they're not supposed to be flying a drone or they're not doing it legally, at least. So these are some things that are still open questions, like how do you actually help people identify who owns a drone? So those are just some of the ideas of the implications of the work. Obviously, there's some limitations of our work. Um, this was mostly done with students and people who worked at the University of Maryland. It was a small sample. We did this indoors, so maybe people might have felt slightly differently if we had done this outdoors. Um, and also, you know, for future work, um, we're looking at doing things like maybe addressing campus-specific issues and then building better feedback so that people know when a drone is recording, if drones are in their vicinity, and how to actually link drone drone encounterers with drone owners. Okay, so that's pretty much all I have for the talk, and I'm happy to answer questions about the study or whatever I know about drones. <laughs> Thanks.